mobile front project. So uh, I don't know, maybe there are some few faces that were not here yesterday, so let me very briefly introduce uh, Mark Miller. Uh, so Mark is working for Google as a research scientist in California, Mountain View. And uh, together with the Kaha Norris, he's working on a project called Kaha, capability JavaScript, uh, on uh, securing uh, JavaScript using object capabilities. So yesterday, Mark uh, took us on a tour about the history of uh, computer security and um, uh, talking about security as an extreme form of modularity. And today, that's going to be sort of the main focus of this talk. So he's going to talk about starting from the foundation of object-oriented programming, how you can build and secure uh, systems of the hard for resource. Okay, so yeah, here's how you debate about bringing object orientation to security programming. Uh, this is joint work with the Kaha group at the This slide is a tour of the rest of the talk, but I want you to read the slide backward. Uh, what I'm going to present the talk as, as a tour through seven levels of abstraction, where each level builds on the previous one. So, so we're going to take the talk in bottom-up order, uh, because some people were not here yesterday, I'm going to briefly, I'm going to, have, I'm going to have some redundancy with yesterday's talk as I cover the first two layers, but then we're going to be getting into new stuff. Um, I'm going to start with the foundations of, of uh, just a brief overview of the foundations of objects, references, and messages, re-explaining the stuff that should already be familiar, uh, how we build object capability security out of that, but then I'm going to be Next level up, I'm going to be presenting the use of object capabilities to express access abstraction. Now, an access abstraction being a new kind of abstraction mechanism that's um, a, a fourth fundamental kind of abstraction mechanism uh, alongside the familiar procedural data and control abstraction, and, and talk about some of the logic by which these abstractions compose. And then patterns of safe cooperation, at that point, I'll be going through the money example that I mentioned yesterday, going through explaining how it works. And then with, with money as an example, um, and with object references as the other example, I'll be teasing apart the dimensions by which kinds of electronic rights differ, and using that to, to, to give hints of the start of a taxonomy of kinds of electronic rights. Once you have a logic of multiple kinds of electronic rights and multiple means to transfer rights, um, uh, you can use that logic to build up to the expression of smart contracts. A smart contract is um, like a familiar contract. Uh, it's an agreement between two parties or end parties um, uh, that binds them for, to a particular framework of interaction. But a smart contract is expressed in program code uh, for cheap machines to interpret rather than expressed in prose for expensive lawyers and court students. And uh, then I'm going to talk about, uh, so throughout, the theme will be abstraction and composition, descending levels of abstraction, and then at each level of abstraction, how the abstractions compose with each other to lead us to the next level of abstraction. So I'm going to close with an example of the composition of contracts uh, to, to form uh, networks, of, networks of contracts. Okay, so um, the foundational relationship in object-oriented <coughs> programming is the points to relationship. When you have two objects, Bob and Carol, what are all the ways in which Bob might come to point at Carol? But the pointer is a, is a means of designation. Um, uh, what are all the ways in which Bob might come to designate Carol with his pointer? Let us count the ways. The first and most important one is by introduction. If Bob and Carol both already exist, and Bob does not already have a pointer to Carol, then the only way in which Bob can come to hold a pointer to Carol is if there exists a third object, such as Alice, that already has a pointer to Carol, that already has a pointer to Bob, and decides, for example, by sending this foo message with Carol as an argument, decides to share with Bob her, her access to Carol, her pointer to Carol. And in so doing, she transfers to, Carol, to Bob 
a copy of a pointer to Carol. Bob now receives a pointer to Carol. Bob can now make use of Carol's public interface. If Bob already exists and Carol does not, then if Bob <coughs> creates Carol, at the moment of creation, Bob holds the only pointer to Carol. If Carol already exists and Bob does not, then if there exists a third object such as Alice that creates Bob, she can create Bob, she can choose to create Bob so that Bob comes into existence already endowed with the point of account. And finally, if nothing exists, then when the universe of discourse comes into being, the, the start of our, the initial conditions of our analysis, that initial configuration might be one in which Bob already points a count. So a system in which these are the only ways in which Bob can come to hold a reference to Carol is known as a memory safe system. Um, many languages, for example, Java, are already memory safe in that they can't, if Bob doesn't hold it, get, get a pointer to Carol by these rules, he can't forge a pointer to Carol by, for example, casting an integer like they can in C++. Uh, many languages, once again, Java is an example, um, have real encapsulation where if Bob has a pointer to Carol, he can make known of Carol's public interface to make use of the services that Carol was designed to offer, but cannot reach through her public interface to a private instance variables and manipulate state that Carol's author did not intend Bob to access. To these two elements, we only need to add two further restrictions to get from objects to object capabilities. The restriction that an object can only cause effects outside of itself by using references that it holds, and that an object is not given any powerful references by default. And by powerful reference, what I mean is a reference through which it is enabled to cause effects. So references to transitively immutable trees of objects that don't lead to any I.O. devices or, or mutable locations uh, uh, don't count with regard to the safety issue here. With these three restrictions taken together, each individual <coughs> object is born naturally sandboxed in that it has no ability to cause effects outside of itself other than according to the decisions of other objects to, to enable it to cause such effects as represented by the references to other objects that they provide to that object. With these three constraints together, we get the following, uh, the following benefits. <coughs> the reference graph from the programming language literature becomes identical to the access graph from the access control literature. We have a very nice graph, graph connectivity property that we call only connectivity begets connectivity. What this means is, for example, if you have two isolated subgraphs, they must remain forever isolated because no object can ever come to be in a position to introduce them. And that's why classic garbage collection is completely transparent. More interestingly, if you have two almost isolated subgraphs, they can only interact or become further connected according to the decisions of the objects that have a foot in both. And therefore, those are the positions in the graph topology that are the strategic locations to place the objects whose behavior expresses security policy. We'll shortly see an example of that. And we bring the power of object-oriented expressiveness to the expression of security patterns, uh, resulting in the ability to express um, uh, security patterns that are normally thought complex with simple elegant pieces of code. And in this talk, I'll be exploring some real examples of that that I only touched on yesterday. <coughs> I'm going to give all of my examples in a, in a um, variant of JavaScript known as Secure ECMAScript, or SES. Um, on this slide, I'm going to teach you approximately all the foundations of JavaScript itself you need to know. And the next two slides teach you 
um, uh, specifically how secure ECMAScript works. Um, JavaScript, for all of its irregularities, is at its core has a really beautiful and simple core. And it really has two foundational abstractions, the function and the record. Make counter is a function. Every time it's called, it makes a count variable, and it makes and returns a record from this open curly to this closed curly. And the record has an inker field and a decker field. The value of the inker field, excuse me, The value of the inker field is the function that this function expression evaluates to. That function, when called, will increment this count variable and return the resulting value. And likewise for the dec for decker, decrement the count variable. <coughs> Here's the graphical notation I'll use throughout the talk. Uh, lexical scoping is reflected as spatial nesting, make counters and scope throughout the, this piece of code. Multiplicity of layers represents multiple instantiation. Every time make counter is called, it makes a new such triple, new triple with an inker, a decker, and the count variable that's shared access to. Inker and decker are shown on the surface of the layer because they're accessible outside the layer. Count is shown internal because only inker and decker can access the count. There's no direct access to this variable that can escape from this layer. So this composition of records and functions gives us back the classic object from object-oriented programming the record itself is effectively an object for which inker and decker are the two methods of the object, and count is the instance variable. Uh, to build, um, in ECMAScript 5 brings us uh, two new constructs that I'll only mention briefly today. Today's talk is not really about JavaScript, it's about object capabilities in the abstract. I'm just touching on JavaScript to the extent needed explain the notation. Um, uh, this use strict is a feature that came in with ECMAScript 5 that repairs all the scoping issues. So we just have genuine lexical scoping and functions become truly encapsulated. Um, this def from SES built on something from ECMAScript 5 just makes this record tamper-proof. And the result of these things together in ECMAScript 5 and in secure ECMAScript give us objects that are able to defend their integrity. It's a tamper-proof record of lexical closures, truly encapsulating state that gives us a, 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 a properly defensive object. Okay, this is um, the important part of how uh, secure ECMAScript further differs from just ECMAScript 5. Uh, to turn an ECMAScript 5 environment into a secure ECMAScript environment with just an initialization script that you run, it runs through these seven steps. The only one important for today's talk is what we do with the val, which is we replace the built-in eval with a, a wrapper that, that um, enforces <coughs> that all code that it evaluates is, is in the strict variant of ECMAScript 5, uh, which just means that we, we can guarantee true lexical scoping. And we leverage that lexical scoping guarantee by having our wrapper for the original eval, a safe eval, guarantee that the only variables, the only global variables that the evaluated expression can reference are the ones on our whitelist, all of which are frozen <coughs> and need only to transit over the immutable state. So all of the pre-existing objects, all the pre-existing values that the evaluated expression can access simply by naming them are all ones that, that, that are completely harmless, that don't lead to any ability to cause any effects. So the, the provi providing access to those objects does not violate our rule, no powerful references by default. Here we see our first access abstraction. This is the, the first for those who uh, were here yesterday. We're, we're uh, now going into new territory. Um, this access abstraction is called the caretaker. As we see, it's structurally identical to the counter. Um, <coughs> over here on the code on the right, we have a, a restricted form of it, re restricted just for expository purposes. 
It's a function caretaker. Um, what the caretaker is about is a pattern of revocability. The function caretaker creates a revocable wrapper of a function. The full caretaker creates uh, revocability both for, for functions and for records. Um, but the, the means needed to do that for records is, is complicated in ways that are distraction from the point of the talk. So every time make function caretaker is called with a target where the target is assumed to be a function, it creates and returns a record of two methods, wrapper and revoke, both of which share access to the target variable, the variable being the parameter variable over here in the function head. And the wrapper acts identically to the target function in that every time the wrapper is called, it simply forwards the call to the target function. And whatever the target function returns, the wrapper then returns. Until somebody calls revoke, which sets the target variable <coughs> to null. Why is this useful? Well, recall our connectivity by introduction. When Alice sends the message through to Bob, she's giving Bob full, unconditional access to Carol forever. Typically in object-oriented programming, that's actually the typical thing that you want. But sometimes it isn't. For some purposes, this might be more authority than Alice wishes Bob to have. Um, might be more authority than Bob needs to have. Um, so in that case, if Alice wants to give Bob some restriction on that authority, she expresses that by interposing an attenuator. So the caretaker is a particular kind of attenuator, which is it attenuates authority in the temporal dimension. Bob, by being given access to the wrapper, so, so Carol instantiates an instance of the caretaker, holds on to the revoke method of the caretaker, gives Bob the wrapper, and then Bob, when receiving the wrapper, Bob can now use the wrapper, effectively using Carol, um, using Carol's services, um, so Bob, at this point, has full <coughs> access to Carol, but not unconditional full access forever. He has full access to Carol until Alice changes her mind. When Alice does change her mind, she invokes the revoke, that drops the target variable, and now <coughs> the base relationship, which is the primitive pointing to relationship, is not revocable. But notice that the irrevocability of the primitive relationship did not prevent us from revoking what we were interested in revoking. Bob still has unconditional, full access to the wrapper forever, but the wrapper is now fully useless forever. <coughs> so the reason I call this an access of distraction is that if we ignore how it's implemented from the point of view of the users of the abstraction, what we've done is we've added a new kind of <coughs> reference to our menagerie of references. We both used to have just one kind of kind of reference, now we have other references. This is the caretaker act, act, acts effectively like a, a smart reference whose additional property is, is severability. That the reference stays connected until Alice cuts it and Alice holds the ability to cut it. This also gives the basic lesson of, what, of how you practice object capability style, how you bring object orientation to security programming, which is you express security policy by the behavior of the objects that you provide. So when I talk about kinds of abstraction mechanisms, uh, data, pr uh, procedural data, control, and access abstraction, let's go over what, what, I, what, what that means. Our machine instruction sets and the, 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 the basic elements of our programming languages give us various primitive operators for operating on data. Addition, field lookup, array indexing, whatever. Um, and by procedural abstraction, we extend our vocabulary of operators. We build new operators for ourselves 
that we can use alongside the built-in operators, like over here is a foo operator that can operate on a bar and a baz, and it just in addition to having a plus operator that can operate on numbers. Our machine instruction sets and the, the, basis, the basics of our programming language give us various primitive data types and primitive, primitive data type constructors, like int, struct, and array. <coughs> and by data abstraction, we extend our vocabulary of kinds of data types we can operate on. Our machines give us primitive control structures of go-to and conditional go-to. Our, our languages give us control structures like if, switch, and while. And by control abstraction, we build other, con other means of manipulating control flow, other control abstractions like Atlas and Visitor. And finally, our machines with the basic addressing logic and the, our languages by abstracting the ad ad addressing <coughs> logic into pointers and unforgeable pointers give us <coughs> one kind of points to relationship. And by building ac access abstractions like the caretaker and the membrane, we give ourselves, we extend our vocabulary of kinds of points to relationships to give ourselves pointers with extra behavior to them, but they're still conceptually kinds of pointers. Uh, what is this membrane that I mentioned? Well, the membrane is a generalization of the caretaker. Uh, it's a generalization of the caretaker that gives us transitive interposition. <coughs> the code on the right is once again a simplification <coughs> of the membrane idea uh, as applied just to functions for expository purposes. In this case, I won't walk through the code. But the basic idea of the membrane is it starts off acting like a caretaker. Bob has revocable access to Carol. But if Bob makes use of that revocable access by sending a message through the membrane, all the arguments of the message get threaded back through the membrane. The result of sending the message gets threaded through the membrane. And then any messages that are sent on those references in turn get threaded through the membrane. So the membrane represents a cut point in the graph, and all further connectivity that's bootstrapped through the cut point gets threaded through the membrane. So that when Alice revokes the membrane, she cuts all of those references at once. So now, to emphasize the point, instead of holding the scissors, Alice is shown holding a much more powerful dynamite pointer. Access abstractions compose very naturally. Over here we see our first type-specific attenuator, which is make read-only file. Uh, given a system in which there's a file abstraction, which is an object that has various methods for reading and writing a file, the <coughs> make read-only file abstraction makes and returns a record ca containing only the, the query methods, not the, write, not the update methods, not the writing methods, from the underlying file object, giving us a read-only view on the, on the underlying file, but no ability to modify the underlying file. Even if the make read-only file abstraction and the caretaker abstraction were written completely without knowledge of each other, they nevertheless compose very naturally. And this is actually very common, which is if we're given a revocable file that was given to us by somebody who used a caretaker to make it, and we wrap it in turn with make read-only file, we obtain a read-only revocable file. So this composition, um, uh, well, yeah. OK. Uh, here's the confinement example from yesterday. I'll go over, I'll go over it again briefly. Um, our eval is the, is the primitive that gives us this property of no powerful references by default. <coughs> If Alice wants to invite untrusted code into her system, she gets untrusted code for Bob from an untrusted site B. She gets code for, for Carol from an untrusted site C. She evaluates the Bob expression using our safe evaluator. Uh, and, and the Bob expression when evaluate just creates whatever the subgraph is according to that piece of code. But because it's evaluated by our safe evaluator, this subgraph has no pointers out that enable it to cause any effects. It's effectively completely isolated. So Bob at this point has no ability to cause effects on the world outside of himself, and likewise for Carol. Um, in fact, Bob's only connectivity to the outside world is that 
the eval in returning the value of the expression is returning some root of the subgraph that Bob creates, which, which Alice stores into her Bob variable, and likewise for Carol. So at this point, Alice and Bob are both completely confined, and only Alice controls how they might interact or get more connected. Alice is in a position of complete power over Bob and Carol at this point. What might Alice do with this, with this position of great power? Well, let's move Alice out of the way so we can see the effects of what she does. If she instantiates our counter, gives Bob access to the anchor method, gives Carol access to the decker method, method, zeroes out her Bob and Carol variables, holds onto the counter, then from this point forward, the only possible interaction among these three parties, even if they, even if after this they would, they, they would wish otherwise, the only remaining possibilities is, is that Bob can count up and see the result, Carol down, and Alice can only do both. So once again, um, uh, the uh, expressing policy by the behavior of objects provided, uh, and locating those policy expressing objects at strategic points in the graph topology. Okay. Our membrane composes very well with our confining evaluator. If we call make membrane around eval, we get a compartment object. Bob's source code is a string. Our membrane allows strings, which is a primitive data type, primitive immutable data type. It allows strings through as is. So when we call uh, the wrapper of the compartment, the Bob source code makes it through to the underlying eval, which evaluates it, giving us the subgraph. But then, when the confining eval returns a pointer to the root object, that pointer gets threaded through the membrane. So Alice doesn't receive a direct pointer to the root of Bob. She receives only a, point, a pointer that she can revoke um, with her diamond pointer to this root of Bob. Alice can now engage in nor normal object-oriented patterns, passing Bob to other collaborators of hers. Bob, the, can, they can invoke parts of Bob, which can react and give out other parts of Bob, or, or give ac other access inside. That these graphs can be co connected arbitrarily according to the normal patterns of object-oriented programming, except that there is a topological constraint that all connections between Bob's world and Alice's world have to get threaded through the membrane. Alice set up the situation so that that invariant is guaranteed. So if Alice later pushes the dynamite plunger, all of the connectivity between Bob and the world outside of himself is severed. Um, Bob is now no longer reachable from Alice's world, so the garbage collector can sweep him up. So Bob, at this point, not only can no longer cause any effects to Alice's world, he cannot even stay resident in Alice's memory. <coughs> so, in thinking about these compositions of attenuators, there's a certain logic to it. And the way I think about that logic is by analogy, by loose analogy to circuit doctrine. Don't take the analogy too seriously. But it's, I think it's a good way to think about it. Over here, a direct primitive pointer is effectively a superconductor. If Bob points at Carol directly with a primitive pointer, then whatever authority Carol provides, Bob has all of that authority by virtue of holding that, re that primitive reference. If Bob has a, has a reference to Carol through an attenuator, the attenuator subsets the authority somehow. <coughs> so, so whatever authority Carol provides, Bob has some subset of that authority. As we've seen, some of these attenuators are controllable. So, the, uh, so if Bob has a subset of, of Carol's authority, where, where the, the extent of that subset is dynamically controllable by Alice, then Alice has a new kind of authority that's created by this kind of attenuator, 
which is the authority to control <coughs> what subset it is that Bob dynamically has. When you do a serial composition of attenuators, like the read-only revocable file, well, in general, that's just functional composition, so it has all of the cases that arise with functional composition. But typically, the attenuators are what we call thinning attenuators, and all of the attenuators in this talk are thinning attenuators. A thinning attenuator is one that, in subsetting the authority, uh, presents the authority through some subset of the same API without remapping the API. So if you don't remap the API, then any action which is successful means what it would have meant otherwise. That the only effect of interposing the attenuator is some actions are no longer allowed, but ones that are allowed mean the same thing. Yes? From my intuition, the only attenuator that you can describe is the attenuator. How can you? I'm sorry. You said the only uh, attenuators that we're discussing in this talk are thinning attenuators that reduce your rights. That reduce your rights without remapping your API. Right, that's the distinction. All the attenuators reduce your rights. A thinning attenuator is one which it reduces the rights only by removing possibilities. But the possibilities it allows are presented through the same API by which they were originally presented. You can have something that also remaps the API, uh, providing a subset of the authority, but where the presented API is different. And at that point, where these two attenuators are remapping attenuators, then the only thing you can say about this is functional composition. You, can, you don't have any further ability to reason. If these are both thinning attenuators, then their serial composition becomes simply intersection of the subsets that they allow, and the, the serial composition is, in fact, commutative. If you, if you do it in either order, it has the same effect. OK. The interesting one is what happens at, you can think of this as joint points in the graph of authority. What happens when an object holds two references? It might be two references directly to two other objects. It might be two references through two attenuators to other objects. Um, so if Alice holds references to Bob and Carol, clearly Alice hold, has all the authority that she has by virtue of holding reference to Bob. And clearly Alice has all the authority that she has by virtue of holding reference to Carol. So if she has a reference to both, <coughs> how much authority does she have? Well, the intuitive answer is simply that she has the union of those two sets of authority. Um, and that's actually the typical answer, but obviously I put the question mark there because the story is more complicated. Let's contrast two different scenarios. <coughs> In the scenario on the left, the entity we've called Alice, let's imagine that Alice is an organization rather than an individual. Uh, organization made up of Alice 1 on the left and Alice 2 on the right. Um, and that these individuals are geographically separated and communicate with <coughs> each other only by discussing things on the phone. Alice 1 holds a can of tuna. Alice 2 holds a can of beer. Now, Alice 1 clearly has the authority that, that the, you know, has, has the ability to do what you can do with a can of tuna, which is very low. Alice 2 has the abilities to do what you can do with only a can opener, which is very low. And the Alice organization clearly has the union of those two abilities. Does Al the Alice organization have any more than that? Does the Alice organization have the ability to get the tuna? Well, there's a strange thing about a phone line, which is no matter how much Alice 2 describes over the phone the characteristics of the can opener to Alice 1, Alice 1 cannot use that description to open the can and get the tuna. <coughs> Where, and the phone line, what it means computationally, the phone line re represents a bit-only channel over which you cannot communicate object references. You can only communicate information. So under these constraints, union is an accurate model. If Alice can bring these two references together, then she can apply the can opener to the can and get the tuna. So in this case, she has 
more than the union of the authorities that she has from the objects individually. So this really raises our expressive power substantially. This allows Alice, for example, to give Bob a can where the amount of authority that Alice has granted Bob by giving him the can depends on what other possessions Bob has. That if Bob has the can opener, Alice has effectively given him the tuna. If Bob does not have the can opener, Bob, she's, Alice has only enabled Bob to enable somebody else that does have the can opener to get the tuna. Well, this sounds like a rather bizarre logic. Let's take a look at more, you know, more specifically what it looks like. These rights amplification patterns actually happen very easily by patterns of normal object going to programming. Uh, over here we see an abstraction, uh, which we call the brand. And structurally, again, it looks very similar to our counter. Every time you call make brand, it makes a new amplifier table. Weak map here is um, just a key value mapping from object identity to, to arbitrary values. But the weakness, for those who know about garbage collection, you'll know what that means. Uh, the, the garbage collection issues are really irrelevant to the, to, to the point of this talk. Uh, so just consider this to be a key value mapping where the, where, where the keys are indexed by object identity. So that's what the amplifier is. And make brand also makes and returns this object, this record, consisting of a seal method and an unseal method. So every call to make brand creates this triple of a seal method, an unseal method, and an amplifier table. So each of these layers represents one of those calls to make brand. Let's see what the seal function does. If Alice calls seal, if Alice has the seal method, and she calls seal with some payload, then the seal method creates an empty object, an object that has no methods at all, um, and is therefore completely useless except that it has a unique identity. So its only utility is that it's an unforgeable token. The seal method then stores an association from that box as key to the payload that, that Alice provided as value, and we visualize that, that box payload pair again over here as another layer in our multiple, la multiple, multiple layer system. So for, for every call to seal, there's another such box payload pair. And then the seal function returns this box to Alice. Let's say Alice then gives that box to Bob. If Bob has access to an unseal function, um, some unseal function, well, he might try to unseal the box by, by invoking the unseal function. If the unseal function he's asked is the unseal function on the same plane as this seal function, i.e. the corresponding unseal function, then the lookup will succeed because we'll find the, the box on this table and return the corresponding payload. Otherwise, the lookup will fail. Uh, if the box is not a box, um, uh, the lookup will fail. If, if the unseal is an unseal from a different plane, that it'll, it'll, the lookup will fail the lookup on the amplifier on that other plane. Um, so why is this useful? Well, so it's useful for the same reasons that public key cryptography is useful. Independent, ignoring how these, these systems are implemented, the logic of, uh, uh, of these systems, the public key cryptography considered as an abstract data type from the point of view of those using it, um, is identical to the brand as an abstract data type. Um, uh, the, the, the implementation of the brand is taking advantage of the fact that when we're within one address space on top of the language implementation, we can make use of the mutual trust of the underlying language implementation to avoid the overhead of crypto. That's, that's why there's no magic. You still need to do crypto when you're going over network. But every call to make brand is equivalent to generating a key pair. Our seal, each seal method from that, from, from that each key pair, each key pair is one of those planes. The seal method from that plane is equivalent to an encryption key. The unseal method is the decryption key. The payload to the plain text and the box to the cipher text. So in a cryptographic system, if Alice says to Bob some cipher text, then if Bob has the right decryption key, Alice has given Bob access to the plain text. 
if Bob does not know the, the, the right decryption key, then Alice has only enabled Bob to enable someone that does know the decryption key to see the plain text. Okay. Now let's walk through, let's actually explain the money example from yesterday. The scenario here is that uh, Alice, Bob, and the bank are three mutually suspicious parties. Uh, Alice and Bob do not trust each other. The bank does not trust Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob trust the bank with their money and nothing else. In the scenario we're going to walk through, Alice wishes to pay Bob to buy something that when Bob is paid, Bob is expected to release in exchange. So she does this by first sending a make purse message to her main purse. Her pre-existing trust relationship with the bank is represented by an object reference to a purse object in her main bank whose, whose current balance represents her account at the bank and likewise to Bob. The, the bank here, for those who attended the talk yesterday, knows this is an asynchronous message sent. For those who didn't attend the talk yesterday, don't worry about that. Everywhere you see a bang, just think dot. It's, for purposes of this talk, this might, ju might as well just be um, a normal object message sent. So uh, in response to sending the make purse message to her purse, the, the, her main purse creates a new payment purse with a zero balance, returns a reference to that. Alice then tells her payment purse, deposit $10 into yourself from my main purse, giving the payment purse access to her main purse, when the deposit message is received, her payment purse does the transfer, acknowledges successful transfer by not throwing an exception. That's all it means to acknowledge success is when the deposit returns without throwing an exception. And then, knowing that the deposit succeeded, Alice now sends a buy message to Bob with the payment purse as one argument in order to bring about the payment and a description of what good she would like in exchange for the purchase. When Bob receives the buy message, as far as Alice is concerned, at this point in the protocol, Bob has been paid. Therefore, Alice has no more use for, for the reference for payment purse, so she may, may as well drop it. That's why I changed the color of the reference. However, I didn't remove the reference from the diagram because Bob must conservatively assume that Alice still holds the reference since Bob has no way to verify that she does not. Although, from Alice's point of view, at this point, Bob's been paid, not from Bob's point of view. Bob has received some object from somebody he doesn't trust. He has no idea what he's received. Okay? Um, even if Bob knew that what he received was a purse implemented by this bank, he doesn't know that it's a purse of the same currency. Even if he knew it was a purse of the same currency, he doesn't know that it has an adequate balance. Even if he knows that it's a purse of the same currency with an adequate balance now, since he doesn't know that Alice doesn't hold a pointer to it, he doesn't know if it will still have that adequate balance by the time he goes to deposit it. So how does he deal with all of these hard problems combined with all of the hard problems of the integrity of the money system that I mentioned yesterday? Well, he doesn't solve these problems himself. He delegates all of these problems to the bank to solve by simply sending a deposit message to his main purse <coughs> with the payment purse as an argument. And says basically to the bank, look, you deal with it. Here's, that, here's that, that alleged payment purse. I have no idea what it is. But if you tell me the deposit succeeded, I'll believe you. Okay? So this when here is an asynchronous form of try catch. If the <coughs> deposit message completes successfully, returns without throwing an exception, or the asynchronous equivalent, which I explained yesterday, then the success block of the when cache runs in which Bob returns the good. So if, Bob, if Bob's execution arrives at the success block, then Bob <coughs> knows that he's gotten the money and he can safely release the good. So with Alice's, Alice's actions being this simple and Bob's actions being that simple, how does the bank take care of all of the problems since we've left all the hard problems for the bank to take care of? Well, 
The bank, as we see, is structurally very, very similar to our make brand abstraction. At the outside, there's a make mint function. And every time it's called, it makes a mint representing a new currency. So each plane over here represents a new currency. The mint function is the right to inflate that currency, to create new units of that currency. Uh, every call to make mint creates a pair of the mint function and the amplifier table. Um, every time mint is called, it makes a new purse object, decrement function, and balance triple. Here's the purse <coughs> object, here's the decrement function, and the balance variable is the parameter variable of the call to mint. And it stores into the amplifier table a mapping from the purse as key to the decrement function as value. So in the scenario we're talking about, Alice's main purse is, this per is the purse over here in the back layer. Bob's main purse is the purse over here in the front layer. And the payment purse is the purse over here in the middle layer. Get balance just returns the current value of the balance. Make purse calls mint with a zero. So since that means that everybody with, with, that has access to a purse has indirect access to the mint, but they still can't violate conservation of currency. You can only do that if you have direct access to the mint. Because through this indirect access to the mint, you can only call, cause the purse to call the mint with a zero. And creating a new purse with a zero balance does not change the total amount of currency. And of course, all the magic happens in deposit, so let's walk through it. When Bob tells his main purse to deposit $10 from this payment purse, what happens? Well, this nap function is a simple helper function that verifies that its argument is a non-negative integer within the <coughs> range of consecutively representable non-negative non integers in JavaScript. And if so, it returns that integer. Otherwise, it throws an exception. So if, if balance plus amount would not be representable within that range, that will throw an exception terminating the protocol error. Otherwise, this alleged payment purse, this object we don't know what it is, we just look it up in our amplifier table. The, the amplifier table being an object identity table doesn't interact with the object at all. It just looks up its identity. And only if it's a purse of this currency will this lookup succeed under all other conditions. If any other kind of object to look up will fail. If lookup fails, this get returns an undefined. Doing a function call on the returned undefined will throw an exception. Once again, terminating the protocol there. If the amount that we're transferring is not a non-negative integer, we terminate the protocol there. And finally, if we've looked up the payment purse's Decker function, which is what happens if the lookup succeeds, would be this Decker function over here, the middle layer, then we invoke that with the amount, having verified the amount as a representative non negative integer. What the payment purse's Decker function does is it verifies, again using that, that the, account, that, that the, um, that the purse has adequate funds that once amount is subtracted from it, um, it the, the resulting balance will not go negative. And at, that, at this point, we've passed all of the gating checks, and we have not yet done any side effects. And this is a general pattern, which is do all of your gating checks first before you do any of your irrevocable side effects. And then once you start doing irrevocable side effects, make sure to do them to completion. If you don't have any error cases left. So, we assign the decremented, the payment purse assigns the decremented balance, returns, <coughs> and then Bob's main purse increments its own balance by the same amount, and we return, uh, and Bob releases the good balance. Okay. Now, what you've seen here is more than just building money out of objects through a simple piece of code. It's building a very different kind of right out of an underlying kind of right. Money is a, is, is, a new, is a kind of right with certain particular properties. 
Um, and object <coughs> reference is a kind of right with very different properties. And by, by comparing and contrasting them, we realize that the differences teach us about four dimensions, four of the dimensions on which electronic rights can differ from each other. And by teasing apart these four dimensions, we give, give ourselves a start on a taxonomy of kinds of electronic rights. So when, when Alice gives Bob the payment purse, she's sharing access to the payment purse. Alice might still hold access to the payment purse. And so whenever you transfer an object reference, you're, you're sharing access to the object that it designates. Whereas Bob only considers himself to be paid once he knows that he's gotten exclusive access to the money. So long as Alice might have access to the money, Bob considers the transfer to be meaningless. It's only meaningful, the, the acknowledgement that Bob gets from his main, his main purse is an acknowledgement that Alice has now been denied any further access to that, to that amount of money. Object references are specific. The, the reference to the payment purse designates that particular payment purse. It doesn't just de designate some general payment, some, some payment purse. Um, whereas money is fungible. One, one dollar bill is as good as another. This, this isn't just a property of money. Barrels of oil are traded this way. When people trade barrels of oil. They're trading a certain quantity of a certain grade of oil. Uh, they're not trading specific physical barrels. Uh, this is a property that economists call fungible. Object references are opaque. The only thing you know when you receive an object reference is, here's something you can send messages to. You might know something by context, for, by virtue of the fact that you received it in a particular position at a particular parameter from one of your clients. But as far as the object itself is concerned, it's just something that you send messages to. <coughs> it does whatever it does in response to messages. Bob doesn't consider himself to be paid until he knows he's gotten some, some particular thing. Um, in this case, money of a, particular, a certain quantity of money of a certain currency. Um, and it's that assayability, which is just a fancy term for measurability, of Bob's ability to know what it is he's received that allows Bob to decide to release some good in exchange. And objects are exercisable. They do things. The, the right you have when you have a reference to an object is a right to invoke its behavior. That, that behavior might lead to I.O. affecting the external world, printing a page on a printer, rendering something to the screen, whatever. Whereas money is purely symbolic. It doesn't have any intrinsic ability to be exercised. You can't eat a dollar bill. Or rather, you can, but it doesn't do you much good. Now that we have a notion of what it means to, have a, to be able to build out of our primitive object material a variety of kinds of rights and a variety of kinds of rights transfer logic, we can now leverage that to build contracts that are, that are negotiated arrangements for the manipulation and exchange of rights. So a way to think about this is to think of the contract as a board game. When you and I negotiate a contract, what we're doing is we're, we're jointly designing the rules for a game that we would both be willing to play. We're both willing to play it because we both expect to win. Because the games the contracts represent are generally positive sum. There's no paradox <coughs> for both of us expecting to win. Generally, both parties, in fact, do win, which is why they, they commit themselves to the contract. Once they commit themselves to the contract, they're now playing the game. And they're playing the game according to the rules that they've already agreed to. Um, so as each player makes a move, the moves can only be the moves allowed by the contract, allowed by the rules of the game. Each move changes the state of the board. And what moves are legal depends on the current board state. So each move changing the board state changes what moves are legal next. And finally, the rights themselves, we can view them as the pieces placed on the board. When we place the pieces on the board, it's each party is escrowing various rights with the rules of the game. 
because placing various rights of theirs under control by the game no longer under their own control. And now they can obtain rights back from the game only according to the rules of the game that they have agreed to. Over here we have a simple exchange game shown as a state, state transition diagram. And this is the initial state. This gold bar represents Alice's money. The knight represents Bob's stock. And, and Alice and Bob are going to use this to, nego to, to, um, to negotiate, having negotiated that we're playing the exchange game, they're now going to use the exchange game to negotiate a trade of money for stock. So if Bob parts a certain amount of stock on the board, he's transferred the stock from himself to the game. The game, now owning the stock, can asset it and, and, and represent to Alice accurately what that stock is that Bob is offering to Alice. Uh, depending on what Alice sees here, if she refuses to, if she does not interested in buying it, then Bob might remove the stock and place a different amount of stock on it, and back to here and then back to here. If Alice likes it, she might put a certain amount of money on over here, which is either acceptable to Bob if not, or not. If it's not acceptable to Bob, might, Alice might remove it, place a different amount of money. And finally, Bob might accept Alice's offer, take the money, and we show the money on the right side of the board here, meaning that, that Bob has removed the money. And that's the unidirectional commitment there. That's the irrevocable step. Once Bob picks up Alice's money, the only remaining possibility is for Alice to pick up Bob's stock. To implement this, we need five players. So these, this pattern of five players arises over and over again. Um, the five players are the dollar issuer, which follows the logic exactly of the bank that you've ever seen, the stock issuer, which follows exactly the same logic, can be implemented with exactly the same code, but now the units represent stock in a particular company rather than units of a particular currency. The contract host, which is a server that's mutually trusted by Alice and Bob only to faithfully run whatever piece of code <coughs> Alice and Bob have agreed, mutually agreed on, and to, to provide Alice and Bob the assurance that this is, in fact, the code that they've agreed on. Um, and in setting up the game and running that piece of code to provide Alice access to the chair on the left and Bob access to the chair on the right. In this situation, um, the dollar issuer doesn't have to trust any of the other four parties. The stock issuer doesn't have to trust any of the four other four parties. The contract host doesn't have to trust any of the four parties. Alice and Bob don't have to trust each other, but Alice and Bob both have to trust all of the other three parties or this arrangement is meaningless. Over here we have another example for, of a contract that I'm not going to go into in detail. This is a particular financial instrument called the common call option. But the, the reason I'm showing it is to make the point that many contracts have a time component to it. And that time component changes the nature of the game. So in this case, there's a, de there's a deadline represented by this clock that's ticking away. Before the deadline expires, the only transition possible from this state is this transition. Once this deadline expires, then Bob can pick up his stock and turn it into <coughs> like a game So until the deadline expires, Alice, while she's sitting in that chair waiting for the deadline to expire, she has the choice about whether to put the money on the board and, and, and exercise the option, as it's called. Um, so Alice, having that choice until the deadline expires, has something valuable. Well, since it's something that Alice has which is valuable, Alice might like to trade it. Well, if she wants to trade it, she might, for example, instantiate the exchange game over here in a game with Fred to sell Fred the option. And what the option, what, what she's selling to Fred is the right to sit in this chair. So this contract host over here running the options game 
in, in this game, the horizontal game, the role that that server is playing is the role of contract test. In the diagonal game, that same server is playing the role of issuer of the right to sit in the chair. So, I've taken you through all this to show that once you take this approach to the engineering of security problems, you, keep, you can proceed up the levels of abstraction to create um, abstractions from manipulating rights and with good attention to the architecture of those abstractions, create composable abstractions, and then by exploring those compositions, end up creating yet, <coughs> yet further levels of abstraction. And now I'll take questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Theo. If I understand correctly, that if your model of references are you need explicit endowment to have some preference? Yes. Because uh, so you, at this one stage you used a recursion. The, the mint example used recursion, if I remember correctly. Well, well that's, hmm, that's a kind of cheating, isn't it? Where do you see recursion? Um, in the make first. Oh, oh, right. The, the, the make first calling the mint. Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, I'm not saying it's about this because you, you may want to protect yeah. yourself against yourself. I yeah, just want to establish that, that it actually fits within the rules I laid out here, which is this, this is the endowment size. Okay. And the code that I showed here that corresponds to this diagram is that within Alice's code, the expression that she uses to express the creation of Bob simply contains a pre-reference to Carol, which is a lexical reference to... It's a hidden argument to the function. Well, it's, it's a lexical reference. It's a free, it's a free reference yeah. within the text of the function. Mm -hmm. And it's a free reference whose, whose corresponding definition is, is is in Alice's lexical scope, and and with with Bob, when Bob is textually authored by Alice in that fashion, by basically when the source code of Bob is part of the source code of Alice, then <coughs> it's part of Alice to express what Bob's endowment should be. Now, uh, so th this pattern where Bob's code is is itself part of Alice's code, and therefore is itself part of Alice's expressed intention. We call that closed creation. Mm -hmm. Eval we call open creation, in which the code is not part of the instantiator's expressed intention. It's gotten from elsewhere. And in that case, we don't simply allow naming to implicitly acquire references from the containing environment. We, we, we require those to be explicitly provided by other actions. And you need to do that by, by adding another I don't know, method? Where you translate Yeah. Typically, um, because the eval evaluates with, with, with nothing useful in scope, what it evaluates to is a function whose parameters are the means for accepting yes. the further endowments that the instantiating context wishes to give. Okay. Yes? So, I mean, isn't it true that you don't really need the endowments because you could always do this by introduction? Isn't this just for your convenience? Um, yes and no. Small talk, in some sense, demonstrates that you don't need endowment to be a separate mechanism. And I agree with that. You don't need to be a separate mechanism. You don't need to be a primitive mechanism. But in any system in which it is not a primitive mechanism, in which you have instead, like in small talk, an init method that's a method on the instance, if you don't do something to protect that init method, then, you're, then even after instantiation, your clients, who you might not trust, can call it on you and reinitialize you, which is not your intention in offering the abstraction. So in a system that only has init methods, in order to write defensive objects, you, you, you end up with a pattern where every object with interesting state 
every object has a flag that says, am I initialized yet? The init method refuses to, checks the flag and refuses to run if it has been initialized yet. And all other methods refuse to run it if it has not been initialized yet. Once, you, once all objects have followed that pattern, to understand the resulting system, the resulting system is now at a level of abstraction, you know, has, has created again the level of abstraction where effectively you have endowment. But, you, but you're correct that you don't need it as a primitive. Oh, come on, anybody else? <laughs> so Mark, are you aware of any uh, systems built according to these principles? Uh, the, the creator of the concept of smart contracts is a guy named Nick Zappa, uh, who has been pursuing um, very different cryptographic means and very interesting cryptographic means, multi-party secure computation, all sorts of interesting fancy cryptography for achieving a very overlapping set of goals. And um, uh, the whole idea of smart contracts was very <coughs> inspired by his idea of smart contracts, which has gotten, gotten started in a lot of, a lot of these directions. Um, the main advantage you get of doing it with fancy cryptography rather than the techniques I'm showing here is over and over here you see these, these mutually trusted third parties. They're only mutually trusted per interaction. In Alice and Bob want to pray, they need a mutually trusted escrow exchange agent. Each time they want to do that, it can be different parties. So there's no, it's not, it's not like PKI where you have a globally trusted third party that becomes a central point of failure for the system. But still, with fancier crypto, you can often transform away the need for those two third parties, and, and Alice and Bob can deal directly. I'm not pursuing that. Nick Zabo is, and it's very interesting work. Uh, also, um, there are the work that I mentioned on Bitcoin yesterday is a fascinating piece of work on creating a decentralized money system, and inspired by, <coughs> among other people, Nick Zabo again, the Bitcoin system actually has in it some built into it some mechanisms for expressing smart contracts in addition to just simple money exchange. I don't know that anybody has actually made use of that mechanism in the Bitcoin context, but I also don't know that they have it. I'm not familiar enough with the actual practice of Bitcoin to know. But the fact that those enablers are there is very exciting. Uh, that's the extent of what I know, but it might very, oh, and actually I should mention, um, there is a variety of essentially automated contractual systems where some contractual arrangement is, 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 is represented in an automated mechanism by which parties interact. And Nick Zabo, when he introduces the concept of smart contracts, I think he does a great job of saying the simplest smart contract is the vending machine. Okay? Um, the vending machine, you put in money, you get out the code. Um, if you don't put in the money, you don't get the code. It's, it's essentially an escrow image. You, you first escrow, only once it knows it successfully escrowed the money, does it release the code. Um, and notice there's an interesting asymmetry <coughs> in which you learn a lot about smart contracting, which is the trade is symmetric, money for code. There's an escrowing that needs to be done. Why is it that the, the vending machine first asks for the money and then releases the code? Why doesn't it? first give you the coke, and then once you've successfully escrowed the coke, then demand your money. Um, and the reason is because one of the parties can walk away from the transaction. <laughs> was, the, was the croquet system inspired by any of these ideas? Uh, croquet uh, was um, not as far as I know. Uh, croquet has um, very interesting similarities <coughs> on the distributed computing end uh, <coughs> that I talked about more yesterday. I don't know that it has much similarities with regard to the rights manipulation. I don't know that they've really explored that. My impression of Croquet is more oriented towards um, uh, just assuming mutual trust, not really taking on the problems of mutual suspicion. Yes? Uh, in your last slide, you said if you design the, the, the contracts right, you can easily compose them. Can you maybe elaborate what designing them right yeah. means? Uh, you, said, you said it slightly differently. But you, yeah. If you um, consider some restrictions, you can compose them. What are the, the kind of restrictions you have to think about? Uh, that's a great question. Um, 
I don't have an articulate answer. Um, I, in some sense, just simply by providing this sequence of examples and showing how composition allows us to send levels of abstraction, I'm kind of communicating um, my sense of how to do it, of how I've done it, and how I've succeeded at it. And I'm hoping that, you know, to, to sort of, that you can learn from these examples very much the same kinds of lessons that I've learned by, in the process of, of discovering these examples. Um, uh, and yes, I'd love to find a way to, to sort of explain in a more articulate way what those lessons are. I don't have a, a, much of a articulation at the moment. But I mean, it recurs in both examples, so is that something that you always do? Are there examples with where you need more parties? Or there are certainly examples where you need more parties. Um, uh, the, 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 the reason why five parties arise so often is when there are two parties to the contract, when there are two kinds of rights being exchanged, then there's the two parties to the contract, there's the issuer for each of the kinds of rights, and then there's the contractors. So that's, that's a very general pattern. And you know, quite often in contracts, you have that pair of twos, which is why this arises a lot. Uh, but certainly you have multi-way contract, you have contracts with a dynamic number of participants, you have contracts with a dynamic num number of kinds of rights and issuers participating. Uh, this entire, because we're expressing all of this in general purpose programming language, we have open to us all of that generality. But when you recognize you know, a certain set of repeating patterns that seem to arise as you go about expressing yourself uh, in, this me in, this, in this media, then um, you try to figure out well, what are some reusable abstractions that you can create for expressing these patterns. And then once you realize, okay, this is, a, this is a reusable pattern that I can provide some help with by providing these abstractions, then you start asking, well, how do they compose with each other? You ask composition questions. And then you refine the, the, the design of that reusable abstraction according to those tests of, of, of whether they compose well. Yeah. Um, in the uh, money system example, you, um, well, the, the main part was the weak map that actually hold, held the references. Okay. Now, I'll let you know, are there no vulnerabilities to the system? I mean, are, are there ways one can access, I know about the extension firefox, let's say, uh, but <laughs> are, is there something, let's say, um, is there a trivial scenario where this would be exposed to vulnerability? In the, the weak map. So, um, so we, whenever we, we're doing security, we have to be very, very careful about our assumptions. Um, what, we're, what, what security people call like your threat model. You have to be very specific about what your threat model is, what problem you're solving, and what set of problems you're not solving. In doing this work in JavaScript, we're sitting on top of a tremendous pile of software, um, and there can be vulnerabilities that blow our security at any of the layers below us. Whenever you engineer a secure system, you're doing it on top of some platform. And whatever that platform is, if you're doing a secure operating system, your platform is the hardware. If you're doing a secure application, your platform is the operating system. Um, whatever your platform is, you're making some assumptions about that platform operating correctly. Um, those assumptions are generally pulled out of thin air in the sense that there's nothing that justifies the assumptions other than the fact that if you don't make those assumptions, you can't continue. Um, so you proceed to do your, your secure operating system not knowing if your hardware is secure, but you've got to start somewhere. And if you arrive at the point where you've secured something at some upper layer and people find that security useful, except that sometimes the security gets subverted through an attack coming in at a lower layer, then what you've done is the usefulness of the security you've delivered to customers at the upper layer creates a market demand to fix the vulnerabilities by which the system was attacked at a lower layer. So that's the thing about approaching the solution space top down rather than bottom up. If you're trying to build maximum confidence that what you have is secure, you want to start from the hardware then the operating system would build up. Um, if you want to, and people have done that 
Those have been technological successes and market failures. If you start on top of the whole pile of stuff that the computer industry has created according to a different security theory, deliver some security that, that would be valuable if everything below you is non-corrupted, then you should, then I'm hoping that starts a dynamic where you can <coughs> propagate the defense against corruption down the stack rather than trying to propagate it up the stack. <coughs> Which would present my uh, next question. Actually, if you use uh, actual public key encryption, uh, is there a way to make sure that we also have some sort of bottom up uh, security in the sense that, okay, now I'm using a hash map there, and um, if I use public encryption, I know it takes time, but if I use that, then I know for sure that I am 99% secure, uh, not. No, the, the, all of cryptography makes essentially the same kind of weak assumption that I'm making about the local platform security of the user of the cryptography, right? If, if your machine has a key locker, when you type in the passphrase that unlocks your private key, it's gone, okay? Um, the, um, so using a standard machine running a standard operating system on top of which we've installed applications and browser extensions, etc., and using that as the machine on which you're going to engage in public key cryptography, you have exactly the same kind of weakness as the weakness that I'm admitting to with regard to doing all this language-based security in JavaScript. No more questions? So you have um, you have introduced secure ECMAScript as sort of the vehicle in which you expose these ideas. Do um, you think it's feasible today already to build these kinds of systems in secure ECMAScript? Or if not, what technologies would be required in order to get there and to express these, in a, these patterns in a comfortable way? Yeah, so um, now that, now that uh, ECMAScript 5, the ECMAScript 5 implementations on the browsers have actually come up to the point where they, they, they really do support secure ECMAScript well. Uh, and um, uh, the server-side JavaScript uh, is reusing the same JavaScript engine that the browser is using, and therefore we have full ECMAScript 5 on the server-side, able to support secure ECMAScript on the server-side. Um, yeah, it's, I think, I think a lot of this stuff, it's now time to do it. And I think it can be done fairly straightforward, pretty much as straightforwardly as, it's, as it looks like it can be done from these slides. Given probably a library to do um, uh, expressive distributed computing. That's right. Um, and given a good solution to the persistence problem, all of this, there's, there's, there's one major technological hurdle that I've, um, I, uh, that now's a good time to be very clear about which is, I didn't explain how these objects <coughs> survive machine crashes and power outages and, and et cetera. Uh, so that all of, the, all of this state needs to somehow be backed by non-volatile storage so that, these, so that these objects can roll forward over time. And there are solutions to that. There's a system that has a very similar logic to what I'm talking about here called Waterkin. The logic is in terms of an object capability subset of Java named Joey rather than JavaScript. But it has a system of orthogonal, orthogonal distributed persistence among mutually suspicious machines that has all persistence properties that you need to support this. Uh, that kind of persistence has not yet been brought to JavaScript. And therefore, you need to do persistence by some other means, and that adds mechanism. No further questions? Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you all for coming.